Thank you, Harvard Arab Conference, for inviting me. It's such an honor to be here. Um, it's interesting to hear my like the introduction because sometimes you, when you move to another culture or you start a new chapter of your life, you kind of you don't want to remember who you are, so you can start fresh and become someone else. Anyway, that sums up my my mood since I moved to the United States in May. So I'm living technically I'm living in LA right now. Um, Great weather, by the way. Um, a bit isolating, LA can be, but um, it's, it's a very interesting um, transition that I'm going through. And they always say that when you, when you make such a transition, it's, you're going out of your comfort zone or your comfort. I'm not sure I was e ever comfortable <laughs> in, in my home country lately. Um, I'm sure you all know, following the news. But um, I thought it would be more of a comfortable uh, change um, because I wanted to Stay, stay away from it all and maybe gain my sanity and, and start and be more of an artist. An artist should always um, stay away from dramas so that he can make dramas, if that makes any sense. So um, I didn't know what to talk about and I had a TED, TED style uh, talk that was ready and I, um, I had, I'd given this talk before. And it kind of changed over the years. It started in 2010. And uh, ba back then it was about um, a very interesting project that I personally experienced in a project called Microphone. Microphone is a film about the underground music bands in Alexandria. When I was shooting this film in Alexandria, I uh, happened to stumble upon a lot of protests because of Khaled Saeed's murder, the young Egyptian who was murdered brutally by the police. And it was just one incident that we heard so many like, but this one kind of stood very special uh, in a lot of uh, youth mind and psyche because Khaled Said was just a very normal, like he can be anyone, he's the guy next door. And we all felt that uh, it could be me. He's a kid sitting in an internet cafe and he got asked for his ID and then we know that he posted something about police corruption and then it, we connect all the dots. And then, of course, the police connected other dots. Like he was, uh, uh, he tried to, to um, basically um, get rid of the evidence, uh, drugs, by eating it and, and suffocating on it. And this is how he died. This is the police story. And these stories kept going back and forth until, you all know, it erupted in, in big rage. And, um, from microphone, when I gave the first lecture, it was about how we were, when we were shooting the film, the protests were happening. And microphone is an organic uh, experiment where we try to keep the stories pretty much like what was happening in, in reality. And we got stories from people, from young artists who made these uh, uh, bands, music bands and stories and, and, and songs. And we decided to connect them all in one, in one film based on true stories. And uh, my lecture and my TED talk was about a very interesting conclusion that when you try to be honest to one single story of a young band, of young people, of a person, something else happens. Something bigger than the sum of these stories happens. So all these stories in microphone about a graffiti artist, a girl who was very, very courageous and brave, uh, who shared a lot of personal, personal stories that would be taboo in, our, in Egypt. A lot of other stories uh, that were also very taboo, like women who couldn't sing because their parents didn't approve, um, gay young Egyptians, Egyptian uh, women and girls and boys. Um, a lot of taboo subjects that couldn't have been shared. But this generation, the internet generation in Egypt, were ready to share it. We're ready to share it in microphone. To the point that we, the filmmakers, couldn't put all the stories because we felt it might, it might be dangerous for them. So that was my TED talk back then. And I had a name for that. It was called The Power of the People. It's just getting stronger than the people in power. There was a tipping, tipping in the balance that it's just happening because of the internet generation. This generation knew better. You could, not, you could not lie to them by propaganda in the TV or news anymore. They've got their own space, public space, 
the internet, the social media, where they can actually exchange ideas and learn from others all around the world and also from themselves and get organized. But that talk completely changed when, a few months later, when I was going to microphone premiere in Cairo, my director was in Tahrir Square for a protest and uh, he didn't come. He didn't come to the premiere. It was 25th of Jan 2011 at night when Microphone was screening its premiere in Egypt. Yeah, funny. And uh, my director couldn't show up and I had to go to Tahrir to figure out what was going on and from there on for 18 days, you know, history happened. And suddenly all these underground bands were above ground in Tahrir, singing all their songs. The graffiti was all over the walls, not only in Tahrir, in every square in Egypt. Something happened in 2010, 2011 that made my talk change completely from microphone experience to the Tahrir experience. From all these underground beautiful artists to those youth flooding like a tsunami all the squares of Egypt and actually galvanizing and bringing all people to be in every single square. How lucky, I said. How lucky is it to witness this in our lifetime? I thought it would never happen in my lifetime. If I ask any of you, would you ever imagine that this would have ever happened in our lifetime? Nobody would have ever thought this could happen. We, th we felt that it will happen maybe one day, but never that, that big, that massive. It was the best of times. That was the title of my second talk. How lucky is it to see, to witness that the streets in Tunisia, with people chanting for freedom, affects the streets in Cairo, affects the streets in every single square in the Arab world. Even if it was not by millions of people in the streets, it did affect the system, the, the governments, the regimes. How lucky it is to witness this time we're living in, to witness this big change that proves that the Tunisian guy who is chanting in Burkeba Street has the same aspirations of that young Khaled Saeed, have the same aspirations of those young people in Tahrir Square, have the same aspirations of every Arab in every square who stood up against dictatorship, injustice, segregation. How lucky it is to witness that. That was the title of my third talk. I called it the unifying Arab awakeness. How lucky it is to see that. This is the biggest historical seismic event in our lifetime. It is the best of times. But, there's always a but. It was the worst of times. And then we remember, of course, Charles Dickens' opening of A Tale of Two Cities, surprisingly about the same kind of times, the French Revolution. Of course you remember, and I'm going to quote him, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of incredulity. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. Sorry, it was the age of foolishness. Uh, opposite to wisdom. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was winter of despair. We had everything before us, but we also had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. Didn't we hear this in TV stations when Muslim Brotherhood took power? We were also all going direct to the other way. It's almost like quotes from the Arab Spring. TV, quotes from TV, from different people. In short, now this is still quoting Charles Dickens' opening of A Tale of Two Cities. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being perceived for good or for evil in the superlative degree of for comparison only. And I'm still quoting Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens back then saw that these times of a revolution, in the French Revolution, Look, felt so much like the times he was living and, and, and describing. 
we have a lesson to learn. We have a lesson to learn from artists living through such times. We have a lesson to learn from history. History tells us that revolutions share the same pattern. And this is no excuse. I mean, it, it is uh, the same with the Egyptian Revolution. There's so many, many parallels, for example, with the French Revolution. When the French chanted their chants of uh, egalité, fraternité, and do you remember that? Liberty. Liberty, of course. Let me just get that in the right sequence. When the French chanted their slogan, it echoed with the uh, Egyptian revolutionaries, Aish, Hurray, Adalek, Temaya, bread, freedom, social justice. There's so many parallels between the French Revolution and the, and the Egyptian Revolution. The storming of the Bastille, the storming of the state security in, in, uh, in Nasser City. The, the slogan, as I said. Also, there's so many, many parallels between them that I think I'm going to leave this because it's not going in the right order now. Um, that, that we feel that we need to learn those lessons. The French Revolution also ended with a reign of terror. But what are the lessons that we learned? And what are the lessons that the regimes and the system learned? Because they're mostly opposite. We learned that we have to break the barrier of fear in order to break the stagnation that we lived in, in Egypt and the Arab world. The regimes learned that fear is the only way to rule so that no more protests like 25th of Jan be allowed. We learned that the internet and the social media is a public sphere and public space where we, where we share ideas and where we get organized as people so that our power can be more and stronger than the people in power. The regimes learn the opposite completely. They learn that the internet is a threat. Social media is a threat. And organized, admittedly actually, <clears throat> state leaders admitted it, platoons be organized to confuse people online and, have, and spread different opposite opinions to what people are thinking and basically be pro-governments. We learned many lessons that would probably change this region to a much better region. We learned that it is possible in our lifetime. They've learned that they need to postpone it as much as possible in their lifetime. I just want to end this with the big lesson that we should all learn that it can be the best of times or it can be the worst of times. It can be a season of light. It can be a season of darkness. It's up to us. We have to weigh both. Do you believe that the Arab world is have aspirations and beliefs that unites them and there's an awakening happening, proven? Or do you believe that what the regimes claim as stability is more important than breaking the stagnation that we try to break? It's up to you. But if you go back to history, I think the answer is right there. Yes, there was a reign of terror. But Robespierre, who instigated it, when he died, the reign of terror ended. And the slogan for the French Revolution ruled. Aish, Horia, Adalek, Maya will rule. It's all up to us. Thank you.